All right, so it is time. I have started the recorder. I just need to move the right notes into the projector. Give me a second here. There we go. All right. So I just verified that the recorder is on. All right, you guys ready? All right, excellent. So the recorder is on. Um, I'm recording. The screen is right. The microphone is set up correctly, so we are all good to go. Um, cool. So I just got one question before you know getting into the content of the class. How many of you are taking Iraj's class right before this? Almost the entire class. <laughs> All right. Well, this is this is good in a way because you know that means I can coordinate with Iraj in terms of the introduction of concepts uh, such as recursion and you know some of the other concepts. Um, so that's good. And do you guys have enough time to transition you know, between Rave Hall and here? Yeah, it's okay. Does it usually let you go like right on time or a little bit before? Varies. It's interesting how he uses a rave hall for quote unquote the lab of that class. Hmm. Okay. So, how, what do you mean by switch out? Oh, okay. Yeah, the problem is it's a larger class, so it won't fit into a regular classroom, especially if it needs to be a lab classroom. He can fit into uh, 301, you know, the main lab, you know, but the main lab is usually open for uh, general student as well. But I think during this time, at least you know, in this semester, there might be enough space so that he can actually conduct the class, you know, as a lab with most of the lab and still have maybe one or two rows of you know computers open to the rest of the class. Uh, other people, you know, who need to use the lab. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, so what we're gonna do today is to officially talk about quantifiers. Last time we got started in quantifiers, but today we're gonna get into quantifiers in a much more formal way. So we'll basically be going through this material in a much more sequential manner. I'm gonna close the door. There we go. Okay. All right. Much better. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to get started here. Um, so we'll, I'm just going to read not you know, every single sentence, you know, but I'll keep, I'll cover the most of the key points here. So the quantifiers is something that we use on a daily basis already. This is the, which operator or which quantifier is this? Okay, I'll give you two choices. There exists or for all. For all, okay, because of the inverted A, okay, which is the first letter of all. And P of X is what we call a predicate. So I explained predicate on Monday. What is a predicate? It's a function that returns a Boolean value, exactly, okay? So that's all it is, okay? You know, it's just a fancy name of a function that returns a Boolean value. <clears throat> so to say that everything in the entire universe makes P of X true, we use the following expression. For all X, P of X is true, okay? So P of X is already enough to say that it is true. So there's no, way, no need to say P of X equals to true because you know, when you use a Boolean value and you don't compare it to anything, you are basically just using the true false value of the expression, you know, in the context. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so in English, this is literally saying for all X, okay, for everything that we call X, you know, in the universe, P of X is true. Okay. So X is needed here because, you know, we need a variable that is um, basically bound to a specific thing so that we can evaluate whether P of X is true for that thing or not. But then we are also doing this for everything in the entire universe. 
when was the last time that we care about whether a predicate applies to everything in the universe or not? We don't. Okay, most of the time we have a certain subset of things that we care about. Okay, for instance, if somebody is new to ARC and they want to find out, okay, are all the professors here, you know, you know, qualified, okay, you know, to do their job? So in that case, do we care about professors at CRC? No. FLC? No. Sac City? No. Right. So that means, you know, most of the time we want to confine to a much smaller subset of things, okay, and not everything in the universe. So we'll talk about how to target a subset in just a little bit. So this is one quantifier. It is called a universal quantifier because it applies to everything in the entire universe. The other one is called an existential quantifier, which is this one here. The uh, E that looks kind of inverted, okay, is, you know, you can remember that as exists, okay? So there exists X in the entire universe such that P of X is true. So what that means is there's at least one thing in the entire universe that will make P of X true. That's what this particular expression is trying to say. Are we doing okay with those concepts? One is every. And the other one is basically at least one, okay? The best way to describe it is at least one. But in a normal conversation, if you don't say at least one, most of the time you say some, S-O-M-E. That usually means the same thing as there exists. So now we are moving on to more complex use of quantifiers. I'm gonna skip this part for now, okay? You know, because you know, it does make things a lot more difficult to express. Uh, when we are not confining to a smaller set. So we'll get back to section three after we talk about how to confine to you know, a subset where, okay, we only want to talk about things in this particular subset. All right, so bro broad statements like nothing lasts forever are not very useful, okay? Because, or um, not everyone is a good professor, okay? It's not very useful because we only want to know are there bad professors at ARC? Okay, so if you just say, oh yeah, there are bad professors in the entire universe, it's like, you're not answering my question. Okay, that answer is useless to me because all I really want to know is whether there are bad professors at ARC, or even more specifically, bad professors teaching CISP classes. Right? Okay, so we want to know how to confine the application of the predicate to only a certain set that we care about. So we are now looking at this particular notation here. So if you apply what we have learned already, this is basically saying for everything in the entire universe. So the for all symbol, which is the inverted A symbol, is still universal, okay? It is still saying, let's go ahead and evaluate everything in the entire universe, okay? And, but we can only look at one thing at a time, and that one thing at a time is called E. E is a variable to evaluate every single thing. But this time, instead of just having P of E inside the parentheses, this time we have A what? What is the name of that operator? Implication, very good, okay? So we have an implication here, and the implication has two sides, okay? The left-hand side and the right-hand side. The left-hand side is also called the precedent, and then the right-hand side is also called the consequent. In this case, the left-hand side is saying, okay, let's take a look at a certain set X. So what is X? Well, X is typically a fairly small subset representing things that we do care about. So in the context of um, are there bad professors, are all professors at ARC good professors, then X is going to be all the professors at ARC. It's excluding people that do not matter in the original question. Is that okay? All right. So what is this symbol again? What does that mean? Sorry? An element of or in, okay? So now we are basically saying if E is in X, then we care about what is P of E. So that's one way to look at it. 
The other way to look at this, remember, implication is the same thing as the negation of the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Is that okay? So in this context, let's just say that X is a subset with all the professors at ARC. And let's say E is currently bound to a professor working at CRC. Okay, so we'll just say it's Professor Marcus at CRC. Professor at the Professor Marcus who is at CRC is an element of the professors at AR, at ARC. What would be the result value of this expression? It will be false. Very good. So knowing that Marcus, Professor Marcus, is a member of the professors at ARC is false. What do we know about the, the value of the implication? It's going to be true. Very good. Okay. So that means, oh, okay, I guess you know, it doesn't matter. Okay, because you know, in the for all you know, type of quantification, we want everything to evaluate to true inside the, the outer parentheses. What about when E is me? Now, Tack is a professor working at ARC, is true. Okay, so now this time, whether the implication is true or not depends only on P of E. In other words, if I'm not a good professor, it's going to impact the value of the entire quantified expression. Is that okay? Yes or no? I've heard an answer. Was that a yes or no? Are we okay so far? No, because we don't want to Oh, okay. So you're answering the original question. Okay. So in this case, you know, because everything that is not in X by default would give us an answer of true for the implication, so they do not impact the quantified expression itself. They would not make the quantified expression false. Is that okay? All right. Um, as it should, because you know, all we want is to say, are uh, all the professors at ARC good professors? Now, if there are bad professors at another college, do we care? No. We don't want that to change the quantified expression or the value of the quantified expression. So having all the other things other than professors at ARC to return a value of true by default is exactly what we want. So this is the way that we filter, okay? This is the way we filter and say, yes, we know there are a lot of things in the entire universe, but we only care about things in this set X. This is how we do the filtering, is we use a element of expression in the context of an implication so that, you know, we only care, or the end result is only going to depend on whether P of E is true for things that are in the set that we care about. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so the next question is, what about um, existential you know, quantifier? So this is the existential quantifier. So let's just say that, you know, I don't want to a college where there is at least one bad professor, okay? So in this context, I'm going to say P of E is, you know, if P of, if E is a bad professor, then P of E is going to be true. Is that okay? And I want the quantified expression to be false in order to, to enroll in that particular college because I don't want any professor at that college to be a bad professor. Is that okay? All right. So in this case, how do we filter? In other words, um, do so let's just say that X, once again, is a set of all the professors at ARC. P of E returns true if and only if E is a bad professor by whatever standard, okay? And I want this entire thing to be false before I enroll at ARC, okay? So that's the context. The quantifier on the outside, there exists. This part, just this part here, applies to everything in the universe, including all the professors at Sac State, all the professors at UC Davis, all the professors at 
Sac City, and so on. Is that okay? So if there is a bad professor at, I don't care, let's say UC Davis, okay, do, do we want that to make this entire statement true? Nope, we don't, because the context is I only want to look, I want I only want to know whether there's at least one bad professor at ARC. The fact that there are bad professors in other colleges should not concern me at all. Okay? So that means the default answer in this case should be false. Anyone who is not a professor at ARC should make this portion of the expression false because I don't want you know, those other elements outside of the set that I care about to give me a answer of true. So I need a false answer by default. And that's why even though we have the same uh, element of X here as in earlier you know, uh, in the universal quantifier, the logical operator this time is, a log is just a conjunction. Because in the conjunction, if at least one side is false, the entire thing is going to be false. So the filtering mechanism is now depending on the conjunction. It is only when x is an element of x that we have a chance of making the entire thing true. For everything that is outside of x, it's going to be false. Is that OK so far? All right. So these are the filtering mechanism, and I'm, I do apologize that I have to skip around a little bit, because the notation that we are going to apply is a little bit, um, there's a little shorthand. So instead of writing this, I can write this instead. Um, can people in the back see it? Because I, I think it's a little bit harder for people in the back to see it. Give me a second. I can move the entire screen up a little bit so it's, everybody can see it. Give me a second. Uh, resize, there we go. So now people in the back can see it. So the shorthand of this notation is this notation here. And then the other notation that we talked about is this one. This is the long hand, this is the shorthand notation. Are we doing okay so far with the notation, how we do the filtering? Okay, all right. <clears throat> So now we can go back and talk about negation, okay? How we apply negation to the whole thing. And that part is back here. So this thing is the same thing as this thing over here. So I'm gonna try my best to use natural language to describe either one, and you can tell me whether it makes sense intuitively or not. The first one, which is the one that I'm pointing at and also what the mouse is pointing at right now, says it is not the case that we can find at least one thing in the universe such that p of x is true. That's what it's saying. Is that saying exactly the same thing as everything for everything in the entire universe, p of x is false? <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do, okay, so what I'll do instead is I'm going to convert this into a, um, into a Boolean expression, and then we'll take a look at the Boolean expression and ask that question again. Are they really saying the same thing? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so to do that, I'm going to use Joplin. And I'm not sure how many of you are considering using Joplin for note taking or just you know documenting your stuff. You know, but I personally find it to be really quite useful. So there we go. And I don't have to start a new one. I can just kind of attach, you know, append to the one that we had from earlier. In fact, you know, I would just put a date here, uh, 2024. Today is January 24th. All right, so let's just consider a set of three things, okay? So let's just say this is a really small universe. We're living inside a, a warped you know, universe with only three things in it, okay? 
And those three things are called A, B, and C. This is the entire universe. The universe only has three things, A, B, C. Is that okay? Obviously, we don't want to live in this universe, but you know, hypothetically, A, B, and C are all the things in that hypothetical universe. Okay. So in that case, if I use the for all, um, well, let me see, what do I want to do? Okay, I want to keep the original expression, which is negation of exists E um, and P of E. All right, so this was the original expression. So now the question is, what are we really talking about? Okay, so we're gonna break this down into a conjunction in this case. Because you know, basically with um, there exist, it is a conjunction. So now it is converted into the negation of a conjunction of P of A and P of B and, oh, it's, okay, I take it back. Okay, I have to fix some things here because it's a disjunction, not conjunction, I take it back. Those are ors, not ands. Okay, so let's see whether this makes sense or not. Okay, we'll focus on the right-hand side unless you want to look at the LaTeX representation. So if the entire universe only has three things, A, B, and C, and I want to say it is not the case that at least one thing in the entire universe makes P of E true, is it saying the same thing as it is not the case that P of A is true or P of B is true or P of C is true. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So now I'm gonna do some Boolean algebra thing, okay? And at this point you can say Boolean algebra voodoo because I haven't really talked about the rules of Boolean algebra. But the one that I'm using is called um, De Morgan's Law, okay? De Morgan's Law is a really cool thing so we'll, we'll first talk about De Morgan's Law and then get back to the derivation. So De Morgan's Law states two things, okay? And both are really kind of interesting. The first one, it says um, the negation of X and Y is really the same thing as the negation of X or oops, the negation of y. And I can I have to change the parentheses just a little bit. Give me a second. Okay, there we go. Put this here. All right. So I'm just going to pause and focus on this one here. Does that make sense to you? Now, there are several levels of making sense here. The first one is intuitively, does that make sense to you? It is not the case that both X and Y are true. Is that really saying the same thing as X is false or Y is false? Okay, so you can say, okay, it makes sense to me intuitively. But there's another way of making sense out of this equi equality. And what tool do you think is helpful in the other way of making sense out of this? How do we prove equality of two Boolean expressions? Truth table, I am glad somebody remembered. Okay, so we can also show the equivalency by using a truth table. So if you're one of those people where words do not mean a whole lot to you, you really want everything to be mechanical, low level, detailed, then you can use a truth table to convince yourself that these two expressions are indeed the same thing. As much as they don't look the same, it's like one has an and and the other one has an or, and then the grouping or the nesting of the negation is completely off. If you're not convinced symbolically that they are the same, you can show that they are indeed the same using a truth table. So, you know, so it depends on your personality, okay? Some people prefer a more intuitive understanding of the material. Some other people may prefer a more mechanical understanding of the material. You can do both. All right, 
So the other one, the other rule of De Morgan's law is exactly the opposite, okay? That one says if you have a or to begin with, then you can end up with an and over here. Okay, so let's see whether that makes sense or not. The left-hand side says it is not the case that at least one of X and Y is true, okay? The right-hand side says X is false or Y is false. Do they mean the same thing? Are you convinced? Intuitively, are you convinced that they are the same thing? Okay, if you're convinced, that's good. If you're not convinced, once again, you can use a truth table to show that the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equality are indeed the same. Uh, they're the, they have the same value for the entire truth table. Are we doing okay so far with D. Morgan's Law? Okay, so with an understanding of D. Morgan's Law, now I can go back here and say, wait, hold on a second here. <clears throat> If I apply De Morgan's law here, doesn't that mean that I can apply the negation to each individual P of A and then change all the or into ands? Does that make sense to you? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do the transformation and then you can tell me whether that makes sense or not. Okay, so I'm going to use a VI command here, uh, which is all, all the way down here. <coughs> Excuse me, S for substitution. I'm substituting all the VEE, which is the OR operator, into a wedge, which is the AND operator. I need to apply a G, otherwise it will only find the first occurrence on that line and apply that substitution once. A G means global, but it's global on the same line. So when I press the Enter key, hopefully this, okay. So you can see how it changed all the uh, disjunction into conjunctions, but I also have to change the negations because now, the negation applies to each and every single one, so they are all distributed here, like that. All right, so once again, you know, you can forget about the left-hand side, just focus on the right-hand side. Is that okay? Based on De Morgan's Law, which applies to any number of items within the conjunction, does that make sense to you? All right. So we are going to digress again, okay? So this time, you know, when we digress, we want to look at the universal quantifier. In other words, in a strange universe where the entire universe only has three elements, we want to evaluate an, uh, a universal, universally quantified expression like this. So we say for all E, uh, P of E. Okay. So same universe, the entire universe only has three things, A, B, and C. This is saying, you know, everything in the universe has P of that something being true. All right? So now the question is, can I rewrite this using a conjunction this time? Okay, can I rewrite this as P of A is true and P of B is true and, whoops, P of C is true. Does that make sense to you? The entire universe only has those three things, A, B, and C. When I say everything in this universe makes P of E true, is it really saying the same thing as P of A and P of B and P of C? Does that make sense to you? All right, so that means for all translates to a gigantic conjunction. There exists translates to a gigantic disjunction. Okay, knowing that, we go, we go back to here, okay? And this time we say, hmm, can I rewrite this and say, it looks like what we have here is everything in the entire universe makes the negation of P true. Does that make any sense to you? Because to say everything makes P of E false is to say to make the negation true. So that means, so this is the last step, and let's see whether this makes sense to you or not. So instead of doing this, we say for all, for all, 
for everything in the universe, the negation, oops, we want to keep that, of P of E is true. So let me finish the entire thing, and then we can take a look at the final form, and you can tell me whether that makes sense or not. So can everybody see how we went from the second line to the third line? So that is a very, um, I would say, unconventional way of looking at the quantifiers, but it really makes sense in a certain way as well, okay? The universal quantifier is expands out to a huge conjunction. The existential quantifier expands into a huge disjunction because if one thing makes the, makes the predicate true, the whole thing is true. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> what if the universe is empty? There's nothing in the entire universe. In that case, what is the result of for all? And what is the result of there exists? Okay, so let me <clears throat> let me write down the question. Okay, so in the universe, in this particular universe, okay, the universe is usually represented by U. Is an empty set. So we want to ask um, for all E in the entire entire universe, and this time I'm going to. Uh, Say something really strange here, okay? Um, and I know the people in the back cannot see the bottom, so let me do the same thing as earlier by resizing the screen so that people in the back can see it. When this building was being built, okay, when they were just planning, you know, the building, I already told the people who were, you know, the architect and also the people who were, you know, in charge of making the screens and the lighting and whatnot not to make the screen like this so that you know people in the back can see everything guess what they did <laughs> or they what they did not do all right so getting back to the the question here okay this is what we are basically asking the universe is empty there's nothing in this entire universe and i want to evaluate for every element in the entire universe give me false so the question is what is the value of that thing? So what do you think? This is, well, there are only two choices here because it's a Boolean, so it's either true or false. I'll give you guys two guesses. What do you think? Zero means false. So instead of P of X or P of E in this case, I don't even care. I just say false. Okay? So the question is what is the answer here? Because we have an empty, we have an entirely empty, in this case, conjunction. So what is the default value of the conjunction when it has nothing in it? It is going to be true. Very good. Okay, so I like that answer. But let's go back a little bit and explain why the default value of a conjunction is true. Okay? <clears throat> the explanation has to go all the way back here and say, okay, you guys can focus on, once again, the, uh, the right-hand side. So um, I'm, I'm going to use a mouse pointer here because I'm not tall. There we go. So would this true and blah, 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 you know, change the blah, blah, blah? Okay, what I'm really asking is this. Okay, let me, let me rephrase that question. If I have true and whatever x is, what, what is it? I'll give you, two, yeah, go ahead. Well, if one is true. Yeah, one means true. So it simplifies to just x. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very good. That's what I'm asking for. Okay. In other words, it's the same thing as asking what is one times blah 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 in normal algebra. You go like, it doesn't change anything. One times whatever is just whatever. 
One is called the identity of multiplication. Same thing here. True is the identity of conjunction. So there's always a little true and blah 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 in a gigantic expansion of a conjunction. That is the reason why, in this case, oops, all the way down, it's just true. Because there's nothing for there's nothing to iterate through, but the default value is true. Okay, <clears throat> if you think this false here is totally unnecessarily confusing, we can keep that p of e because there's no p of e whatsoever on the right hand side because that universe is empty. There's nothing to apply the predicate p to because the universe. Is empty, but even in the absence of p of whatever, that conjunction starts with a default value of true. Yes. So just to clarify, if you were to use like the, um, for all e zero mm -hmm. false, and then say true, it's false if there is a zero. Right. Okay. You can or yeah exactly. So in that case, you can you can look at it as if p of e is just false. I don't even care what p is. The answer is no. Okay. Yep. So it means exactly the same thing. Okay. You know, but I just wanted to make it look confusing. <laughs> Making things look confusing is the way I teach, because you know when things are confusing, you really have to stop and think about it. When things are obvious, it's like yeah, okay, that makes sense. It just whew, goes right through. But when you have to stop and think, it's like wait, what is that again? Then you're really thinking. You're engaging your mind to think about things. All right. So if this is that, then what about this one? There exists e in the entire universe such that p of e is true, but the universe is empty. There's nothing in this universe. So what happens to the existential quantifier for this one? There's nothing to apply the predicate p to. What is the default value of a disjunction this time? It would be false. Very good. And the reason why that is the case is if I go back a little bit <clears throat> and try to explain it here, it is because in a long disjunction, you can always say false or this you know false or blah 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 is just blah blah blah, because in algebra, in normal algebra, what happens when you have an expression of zero plus blah blah blah? It's just blah blah blah, because zero as a quantity, as a numerical value, is called the identity of addition. Yes, go ahead. So essentially, both bottom two statements are the identities of conjunction. Yes. Perspective. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the the concept of an identity of a particular operator is abstract. Okay, I'm not going to lie. It is an abstract concept because those are the terms that people use or mathematicians use in a class in mathematics called guess what? Abstract algebra. You guys have taken normal algebra. Some of you you know, have taken or have to take linear algebra, which is about vectors and matrices. Okay, um, you can make that even more complex by having complex. Matrices and complex vectors, okay, which are necessary in quantum computing. Abstract algebra is a whole different way of looking at things, because what they do is they look at zero not as zero, but zero is an identity of quote unquote addition. But addition is really not addition. They look at multiplication as just an abstract you know operator, but one is the identity of that. So then they also define inverses and stuff like that. If you have a chance, okay, if you have a chance at a four-year university to take abstract algebra, you know, just take it for fun, okay? You know, especially for those of you who go like, oh, I like this kind of you know discussion. You will also like you know abstract algebra. But why would you want to take abstract algebra when it's not needed? 
for practical purposes, what is the reason to take a class that you don't really need to take? It is not on your program, your computer science program. Why would you want to take a class like that? Diversification, okay, but it's also good training for your mind, okay? Your abstract algebra is one of those classes. It's not a difficult class, but you have to look at things from a certain perspective. It is more of a difficulty of shifting perspective than a difficulty of having to memorize things. I would look at calculus and say, yeah, it's hard because you have to memorize a lot of things, okay? I am not that good at calculus. I got good grades, you know, but I'm not good at it, okay? If I have to really rely on calculus to make a living, I'll be starving, honest, okay? But abstract algebra, I'm actually good at, okay? There are also other things related to abstract algebra, or it is one step to, you know, to do those things. I'll, just, I'll give you some ideas, okay? There's a thing called graph theory, which is not the same thing as what we do in this class about you know, um, the A star algorithm and whatnot. So if you're interested in graph theory, you can look it up, okay? The relevancy of graph theory in computer science is, does anyone know? Cryptography, okay? Cryptography has a very close tie to graph theory, which is a mathematical concept. Why is cryptography important? Yep, so it has to do with encryption, which has to do with privacy and cybersecurity. And do you think knowing, you know, encryption, you know, inside and out, will land you reasonably play, paid jobs? And do you think you will have job security in those cases? The answer is yes, yes, and yes, okay? Much more so than any other jobs in computer science. Why is that the case? Why is cybersecurity one of those weird things like, oh, you know, if you're really good at your job, there's no way they're going to fire you. Yep. Uh, it's like harder for AI. Okay, that's one, okay? What about the, the demand of cybersecurity? Yep. There's a huge demand of those jobs. And what about the supply chain? What about you know, the, how quickly are people graduating from universities who are well-suited to get into cybersecurity? It needs at least a bachelor's degree, but if you want to get into cryptography, you need at least a master's degree with a heavy math emphasis, particularly graph theory. And graph theory is related to abstract algebra because it is basically one step on top of you know, abstract, abstract algebra. People who are really good at you know, abstract algebra can probably master graph theory relatively easily. And most universities don't even offer graph theory as an upper division undergrad class. It is a graduate level class. So I'm just pointing out possibilities, okay? You know, math, matters a lot in computer science. Why do you think that is the case? There's a very simple answer to that question. Because computer science is a branch of mathematics. At the end of the day, you are all math students, as much as you don't want that to be true. <laughs> but you're all math students because computer science as an entire field is mathematics. But it, it's computer science. It has got science as a name. You know, why is it not science? Anything that has science as a part of the name is not science. Is political science science? I'm not gonna say the answer because I can get into trouble, but I'll just say that, right? <clears throat> Computer science is not science. It is not about the discovery of natural laws. It is about the studying of artificial rules. Everything that we talk about here are artificial, just like mathematics. All right, so that's a kind of weird digression. <clears throat> All right, so do we have any questions about 
um, the use of quantifiers. Okay. Well, okay. We have a really quick way to check. So what what I'll do is kind of. Oh, I forgot to take row again. Okay, let's go take row first, and then we'll transition to the application of quantifiers. So today's row taking is. Where did I put it? I thought I set it up. Okay, let me refresh. I think I set it up already. I just forgot to refresh my screen. There we go. So you should be able to see the activity now, you know, which is on Canvas. It is right after set notation self assessment, but you won't need, you won't have the, uh, you still need to know the uh, access code. The access code is just exists. I thought about existential crisis, but that was like way too long. So we just have exists. And yes, the time is already past the time. I have to change that oh, just by a few minutes too. My watch buzzed me earlier to remind me, but then I ignore that. So I just have to change that to give you guys some extra time to do it. Let's make it um, 1 p.m., okay? Save. All right, so if you refresh your browser, you should be able to get in, and you have the next 13 minutes to type exists and then pick the option of, yes, I attended, I'm in class today. All right, so I'll take a little pause here. When you're done, you know, doing the role taking activity, you know, you can think about, you know, whether you have questions about the topics that we have just talked about today. All right, so I am going to move on to the next slide, which is actually not back to set notations using quantifiers. There's one little slide in between. It is called big operators and quantifiers. So we're going to take a quick look at that. And I said a quick look, which may not end up to be quick. So we'll take a look at this one. Are we all done taking roll? Is anyone? Still in the role taking activity? We're good? Okay, all right. All right, so we got to take a look at the summation, you know, notation. Uh, so, particularly, this is an example, okay? It's just an example. Uh, sigma i equals 2 to 5, and what we are trying to sum over, you know, i between 2 and 5 is i squared. So, the sigma notation expands to 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared, which ends up to be 54 in this case. Do we have any questions about the sigma notation? Okay, all right. So the question is, how do we explain you know, the sigma notation? You go like, but we already know what it is. You know, what is there to understand? Well, it's about the notation. It's about, you know, if you have to explain the sigma notation to someone who is very good at understanding symbols in mathematics, but has no exposure whatsoever to the sigma notation, how do you define the sigma notation to the point where it does tell you exactly what it does? Turns out it is actually really difficult. Okay, I'm not sure how many of you have tried to explain the sigma notation to someone else, um, but it's actually not very easy. You have to use a lot of examples to show people it's like, okay, this is the sigma notation, this is what it becomes. This is the sigma notation, this is what it becomes, and so on. And then the other person, you know, would have to kind of spend some effort to really understand, oh, okay, so in general, this is what the sigma notation means. So I'm gonna give you an alternative uh, definition. All right. So the first thing is, if B is greater than E, then the sigma notation is going to be just zero. 
Okay, does that make sense? So B is the starting point, E is the ending point. So if B is greater than E, then you would go through zero iteration, and because it is a summation, we just take, guess what? The identity of summation or addition and say, okay, that's gonna be your answer by default. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is how we terminate a loop. So now that we have taken care of that one, the next question is, uh, what if B and E are the same? Okay, so you, we have a sigma notation, B and E turn out to be exactly the same. Then you go like, why do you even bother with a sigma notation? It really is just F of E, because F of B and F of E are the same. Does that make sense to you? We have one item in the entire expansion of the sigma notation. When B and E are the same, you only got one iteration through that loop. Is that okay? All right. So here comes the recursion part. <laughs> the recursion part says if B is less than E, now B and E, they all have to be integers. They can, they're not real numbers, they're all integers. So if B is less than E, then we can rewrite the sigma notation going from B to E, F of I, to Oh, let's take B as a special case out of the sigma notation. Then you go like, then what, what happens to the rest of the sigma notation? Well, the rest of it can start with B plus one. Does that make sense? Yes? Then you go like, how is that gonna help? We start with a sigma notation, we end with a sigma notation with one little difference. What is that one little difference? Where we started with B is now B plus one. So that is gonna be closer to one of the two terminating conditions, you know, particularly when B and E become the same. So eventually, if you look at this expression here, and then you ask, is B plus one the same as E? If that is the case, you can end the recursion with that case. What if B plus one is still less than E? Then you expand it once again. Then it becomes f of b plus f of b plus one plus the sigma where i goes from b plus two to e. So you basically keep expanding it and basically shedding elements out of the sigma notation until the starting point of the sigma notation and the end point of the sigma notation are the same then you don't have anything else to deal with because if you basically fall into that case, you just go like, oh, okay, that's just f of e. So this is a way to use recursion to define something that is otherwise a little bit harder to explain. So recursion is going to be one of those things that I'll use a lot in this class. In terms of real life implementation, recursion is not really a best, the best way to implement algorithms because it's not efficient. Uh, you can run out of stack space. A lot of things can go wrong. But when it comes to mathematics, when it comes to proofs, recursion is one of those really kind of awkward things. It's like, wow, this is a great way of doing things because it breaks down a bigger problem or a bigger thing into smaller things. You go like, okay, we learned that in structured programming, right? You're breaking something big into something smaller. It's called modular programming and so on and so forth. Yes, but there's something special about this. A bigger problem breaks into smaller problems, but the nature of the smaller problem is the same as your original problem. So recursion is special in that perspective, from that perspective. I'll give you one more example. I know this is a little bit out of the context of CISP 440, but I think it is also very important because we will be using recursion a lot in this class. So having a concrete understanding of recursion is actually essential. So what I'm doing is I'm using um, a text editor in this case because you're typing, well, I suppose I don't need that because I can use Joplin for that. Okay, let me, <clears throat> I'm changing my mind and use Joplin instead. Joplin is really good at many things. You know, I should say, you know, Markdown is a very universal kind of Markdown lang or markup language. So I'm just gonna use you know, C in this case, and this is how you can create a 
uh, they, what they call a fenced code block. Um, so that, you know, on the focus on the right hand side. Okay. Once again, focus on the right hand side. I'm just going to type the C program on the right hand side, but it will be um, syntax highlighted on the other side. Um, let's look at string length. Okay. So we just say, let's implement string length, which takes um, a pointer to a string or an array of characters, like so. So are we all familiar with string length as a function? This should be introduced in CISP 360, but certainly by the time you get to CISP 400, this is one of the concepts that you have learned. So I'm talking about the implementation, okay? How do we implement string length? So most people go like, oh, this is gonna be pretty easy, okay? So we, all we need is a loop with a counter, okay? So there are many ways to do this. Do you guys want me to give you an obscure solution or do you want me to give you an obvious solution? Your choice. Hmm? Both. I can only do one at a time. What, which one first? Obscure. obscure. Okay, so we'll do an obscure but not recursive solution. Then we will talk about a really obscure and recursive solution. Okay, so I'll give you a non-recursive solution first. So the non-recursive solution is to say while um, asterisk s um, plus plus s, and I need something earlier to do this. Okay, so we have uh, cons char t is s to begin with, return s minus t. Okay. This is not recursive. I don't see any function call from you know, string length to itself, but yet it is a little obscure. The obscure part is I don't have anything here to actually count the number of characters. Instead of doing that, I have this thing here at the end. What is that? There's a technical term for that expression. What is the technical term of that expression? It looks like arithmetic to me, right? You know, there's subtraction, but the subtraction is not a normal subtraction because I'm not subtracting an integer from another integer. I'm not subtracting a, a double from another double. What am I subtracting? Pointers. Pointers. So this is called pointer arithmetic in C and C++, and it's a very easy way for you to figure out how many items are between this pointer and this pointer. It doesn't tell you the number of bytes in between, it tells you the number of items in between. So if we are not dealing with chars, then you know this will give you, it will take into consideration what the pointer is pointing to, the type pointed to by the pointer. It will tell you how many items of that type is in between the two pointers. But nonetheless, in this case, it will really just give you the number of bytes. So this is one way to do it, okay? So now we're gonna move on to the obscure recursive solution. Okay, so once again, this is a C program, unsigned, string length, const, this. Okay. All right, it starts with an end, and it starts with and ends with a single return statement. There's no conditional statement because we have a ternary operator, okay? So the way this works is that. Is that obscure? A little? Okay, so let's break this down, okay? Let's break this down, okay? So what do you do when I give you an obscure solution like this? Hmm? Question whether it's right or wrong. You know, you can plug it into uh, online GDB or code blocks, you know, just to test it, right? But as you're testing this, you can also try to figure out how it works. So that's one way to do it. The other way is to just analytically look at this code and ask, first of all, what is the code? And second of all, what is the rationale behind the code? Okay, so that's those are the things that we're gonna do. We'll start with the basic stuff, this is a single return statement. I think we all understand what a return statement is in C or C++. Are we good there? Are we good there? Okay, 
So it basically specifies a return value. That's all it does. Okay, so what is this? Just asterisk s. Hmm? It's dereferencing s, and s is a pointer to a character. Okay? But what is this? What is the question mark and the colon? And I'll be, if you join the class later, you know, it's okay, you know, but if you join the class like from the get go, I'll be shocked if you still have the question. Yes? It is the ternary operator. And what is the ternary, op what does it do? What does, what does a ternary expression do? Okay, first of all, how many parts does it have? The name implies three, because ternary means three. So this is one part, this is one part, this is one part. It has three parts. Most other expressions in C or C++ are binary expressions, meaning they only have two parts. There are a few unary operators where there's only one part. This one is odd, it has three parts. So what, we, what do we do with those three parts? Yes? Basically, a single line if else statement. Yes, yeah. it is a single line if else. This part here, whatever is to the left of the question mark, is the condition. So it is treated like a condition. It's either true or false. Whatever is between the question mark and the colon is the what, what I would call the then value. Whatever is to the right hand side of the turn of the colon is called the false value. So the way it works is we evaluate this. We always have to evaluate um, whatever is to the left of the question mark. And then that value is treated as a Boolean. How can we treat a character as a Boolean? How does that work? So this is where people from a Java background would have a different answer from people with a C or C++ background. Go ahead. Um, okay, so let me, let me clarify the question. The question is, if we just focus on asterisk s in the context of, I want this to be a Boolean, what is it really asking? Well, is it asking if it returns mm, Not exactly. Go ahead. Other than zero is good, okay, and go ahead. Um, remember, we're only focusing on this part, asterisk s, you know, in the context of a Boolean. Go ahead. Okay, so let me give you, yeah, go ahead. Yes, that is correct. If it is no, it is considered as false. So the longhand version of this code here, oops, um, the longhand version of this is we are comparing to zero. That would have meant exactly the same as before, except I have to use up what? How many characters? One, two, three, four, five. It's comparing to zero. It wants it to be non-zero. When whatever S is pointing to is not the null character, this thing is true. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the more obscure version because I can save five characters in my program. Hard drive space is expensive. <laughs> of course it's not expensive. I mean, you guys can buy your, what, terabyte hard drive now for how much? I cannot even understand why people need multiple terabyte hard drive. I cannot even fill up a one terabyte hard drive with all the class recording and whatnot. Anyway, all right. So if S is pointing to something that is not null, that means I have at least one character in the string. Does that make sense? Because how, how do we work with strings in C and C++? In other words, what I'm really trying to ask is how do we how do we know where it ends? Go ahead. Yes. So it's terminated by a null character. It keeps going and going until it is 
terminated by a null character. Very good. So if the, if the first character of that string is not null, I know it has at least one character. Does that make sense? Hence the one. You go like, but wait, but tech, this can be a really gigantic long string. What about the rest of the string? Fine, we're gonna ask someone else, how long is the rest of the string? S plus one is, a, is once again pointer arithmetic. It is telling, it, it's returning the address of the byte right after the byte that is pointed to by S, which is the rest of the string. Is that okay? So I know I see one character, which is this one here, but what about the rest of the string? Well, I know this function will tell me the length of the, the rest of the string. I just have to add this one to the length of the rest of the string. This entire thing becomes the actual length of the string that I am given with. Does that make sense? Okay. So, but this is the recursive case. With every single recursive algorithm, you have to say, when does it end? When does it stop, right? It stops when whatever S is pointing to is a zero, is a null character. Because in that case, you go like, oh, I'm seeing the null terminator right away. This string has zero length, and hence this zero over here. Is that okay? But the important part here is how we broke the bigger problem into smaller problems. This is the bigger problem. I'm given a string. The smaller problem is I see one non-null character at the beginning. So I say at least one character. But how do we deal with the rest? Oh, if I just ask string length again, but this time I ask it, count the number of characters right after this character that I'm dealing with, that is breaking down a problem into a subproblem, but the nature of the subproblem is the same as the original problem, just one, one smaller in this case. So that's the essence of recursive way of thinking, the recursive way of thinking about solving a problem. It's a very powerful technique, not only because um, from the programming perspective, you can have super clean code, but also from the perspective of mathematically, if you want to prove the correctness of an algorithm, this is also going to be very helpful because of a concept that we will talk about later called proof by induction. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that later. I'm not gonna talk about proof by induction today, but I do want to introduce the um, concept of recursion and the way of looking at things in a recursive way. Is that doing okay or not? All right. So you can probably see the, the conciseness of a recursive solution. This is way shorter than this. Now, does that make it a better solution? No. This is one of the worst way to write your string length because it is recursive. It's gonna chew up your stack space and you only have so much stack space. You can have 16 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of RAM, and for those gamers, you know, 64 gigs of RAM in your system. But guess what? The stack space for one particular process is still limited to, I think, you know, five megabytes or something like that. It's tiny by comparison. So that means if you have a long string and you're using this approach to find the length of the string, you can blow away the stack in no time. Not a very good solution. So from the theoretical perspective, it is cool, it is easy to prove things and whatnot, but from the implementation perspective, nah, it's not really the best way of doing things. Okay, I just wanted to point that out before you guys start to turn in all your homework assignments in 4.30 recursively. <laughs> all righty. So getting back now to the application of um, recursion. So we are back here. All right, so this is the summation you know, expressed recursively. Um, there are other big operators. You know, pi is the product of, of, of a bunch of stuff. The only difference you know, between um, the use of pi and uh, sigma notation is uh, the default value. You know, what is the identity? In this case, the identity is a one. 
because one is the identity of multiplication, zero is the identity of addition. If you have a bunch of stuff to or, false is the identity. If you have a bunch of stuff to and, then true is the identity. So basically, I can use the same format to define you know, these big operators that works on a sequence of expressions. Okay? You don't have to you know, read too far into this right now, um, except you know, we have now you know, the existential operator. So it becomes something that looks like this, which then expands to something that looks like this. Um, we haven't really talked about function yet, so I can't really you know, go too far into the detail of this notation. So we'll just kind of stop right here in terms of this particular slide. And then once we have talked about functions, we can come back here and talk about the rest of this slide. So the emphasis is you know, recursion. Recursion is quite important in this class, and generally speaking in computer science and mathematics. All right, so now we are revisiting stuff you know, using recursion. I'm going to skip equality for now, and instead we'll talk about um, the set notation. So we'll start with something like this, okay? Do you guys still remember this notation? I'm trying to describe membership of a set where the number of elements in the set can be infinite, and therefore I cannot spell out everything, all the members in the set. So in this notation, it means you know I'm describing each member x is going to have to meet the requirement of making p of x true. So that's the notation that we have already talked about from I think from day one from last week. So this notation really means exactly the same as this notation here, but this time we have a quantifier. We basically say for everything in the entire universe. Um, if that thing belongs to the set E, it can only be because of P of X is true. But that's not the only thing, okay? Because I'm using, what is the name of this operator? There are a few names, you'll just give me one of them. Yep. Say again? If and only if, okay? So it is known as if and only if. That's one name that we, we can use. But what is the name that we used, that I used in the module that talked about the operators? Starts with the E. Equivalence, very good. So this is if and only if, it is also called equivalence. But that means if something is in E, if I find one thing in E, it is guaranteed that P of X is true. What about things that are not in E? If I can confirm something is not in E, I can also conclude right away that P of X is false. But it works the other way too. If something makes P of X true, I know that thing has to be in E. If something makes P of X false, I know that thing cannot be in E. So in this case, the use of if and only if is important because if I change it to if, okay, or just, you know, implies, that would have changed the meaning of this entire thing. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand my last statement? If I were to use just a single-sided arrow, which is implication, it would not have meant exactly the same thing as if and only if. All right, cool. The empty set, okay, the empty set can also be using existential quantifiers. So how do we know that a set S is empty? All we have to do is to, do, to say this, okay? It is not the case that there is an element in the entire universe such that that thing is an element of S. I think that's a good way to say that S is empty. Kind of obscure, right? <clears throat> What about union and intersection? So the way we can define, okay, I'm not gonna say which one is which one. I'm testing you. What is this one? It has to be one or the other, but which one? Intersection, very good. Now how can we remember which one is union and which one is intersection? This looks like an N in intersection. The other one looks like a U in union. 
So that's one quick and easy way to remember. Okay, so getting back to the definition. So in this definition, we have a universal quantifier here, and it says X is a member of the union, uh, excuse me, the intersection of A and B, if and only if X is in A and X is in B. I think that sums up, you know, the definition of intersection. And then with union, it's very similar, except, you know, we change the conjunction into a disjunction. An element X is in the union of the set A and the set B, if and only if X is in A or X is in B, it is extremely important to understand that we are using a regular or, but not exclusive or. We are not saying either or, we're simply saying just regular or, because X can be in both. Are we still doing okay so far? All right, <clears throat> moving on to the Cartesian product. So in the Cartesian product definition, um, we change the way we use the quantifiers a little bit. This is the shorthand. For every X in A, for every Y in B, XY is an element of the Cartesian product between A and B. So this is one statement <laughs> by itself. You go like, isn't that the whole thing about your Cartesian product? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't really help. It doesn't define the entire thing because this, the first part, okay, the part that is to the left-hand side of the conjunction, this part here, is telling us what should be in the Cartesian product, but it doesn't tell us what should not be in the Cartesian product, okay? Does that, is, does that make sense to you? Because the first part, which is the left-hand side of the conjunction, only tells us that if you find something in A and you find something in B, you make a two-tuple out of those two things, where the thing in A is the first item in the two-tuple, the thing in B is the second two-tuple in B, that thing belongs in the Cartesian product. Great, okay? That's part of the main idea of the Cartesian product. But can a Cartesian product contain other things? This part does not say anything about it. So that's why we also need the second part, which is this part here. For every two tuple, x, y, that is in the Cartesian product of A and B, we better make sure that x is in A and y is in B. So it will help us exclude things that are not supposed to be a part of a Cartesian product. Is that making sense so far? More or less? Okay, I know we are at, almost at the end of the lecture, <clears throat> so I'm not gonna introduce any new material because I know you guys are kind of like, ah, okay, I, I kinda need a break. Last semester, I got in the, okay, I'm not gonna name the class nor the person, but um, one person told me that this person could not, does not have the attention span necessary for an in-person class. That was a, a little shocking to me <laughs> because that class, guess what, was an in-person class. Um, and that person told me that because of the pandemic, everything went online. Um, so you know that, that person did not have the usual training slash exercise necessary for an attention span of about 80 minutes. Well, we guess what most classes are like at Sac State or UC Davis. Do you think they're mostly online or do you think they're mostly in person? They're mostly in person. Yep. So, you know, we, we got to get that attention span, you know, up, you know, at least up to like hour and a half-ish or so. All right. So it is the end of today's class, but there's one more important thing. I sent it by announcement already, but I know some people do not read their announcements. So I'm going to say it. Your homework assignment is up, okay? The first homework assignment is already up. If you go to, oh, okay, I'm looking at the wrong screen. So if you go to announcement, the latest announcement you know, is the first homework assignment is out, which means it's available, it's not due. 
It is due next Wednesday at noon, meaning you have about a week to work on it. It is in the form of a quiz in Canvas. You can have up to next Wednesday, up to noon time to turn it in. So don't turn it in, don't submit unless you're 100% sure about the answer. Spend the time to read the material and try to figure out the answers. Okay, go ahead. You mean the quiz, yeah. the homework? Yeah. No, 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 no. This is all on stuff that we have already talked about before today, okay. before quantifiers. So this doesn't even have quantifiers in it. Okay. Yep. So these are all your concepts of your set operators, like yeah. union, subset of, you know, that sort of stuff. Okay. Yep. All righty. Have a nice weekend. I'll see all of you on Monday. Okay.